My name is Mike King. I'm the managing editor of Artist House Music. Um, we're here at Berkeley, um, where I'm the marketing communications manager. Uh, I also um, teach uh, two courses at Berkeley Music, The Future of Music and the Music Business, and Music Marketing 201. I'm kind of a hack musician. Uh, I'm a, uh, what's, the, what's the phrase there, uh, weekend warrior. So um, I play guitar and bass in a band called the P. James Magic Show, which plays occasionally uh, in Cambridge. I think one of the major things, uh, or one of the major problems that people don't um, necessarily think about when they're um, looking at marketing the band or the record is all of the components need to work together. So um, if you're releasing a record, you're going to have to think about press, radio, retail, and internet, and how all of those areas work together. You can't just focus on radio without thinking about you know, what's happening um, at a retailer in that same market. A good example would be if you were an artist who is a college radio artist and you got radio play on WRAS in Atlanta, you're going to want to get a hold of um, you know, Eric at Criminal Records in Atlanta. Let Eric at Criminal know that you have radio play on WRAS. If you don't have a relationship yet with Eric, he could buy your CD uh, on consignment. And then you want to get it, you're going to want to get a hold of um, the press outlet in Atlanta. You know, a good uh, alternative is uh, Creative Loafing. You know, so everything kind of works together. Um, with your marketing plan, you, you kind of need a spark um, to start everything off, and a lot of times that's touring. So when you're going through the market, if you have hired a publicist and if you're working with, say, a radio person, um, you're just going to want to have to concentrate on sort of the main segments within each market. Um, nothing works in a vacuum. The most important thing that an artist can do is to tour, absolutely. Um, touring is, uh, provides the spark that all of the other marketing segments need to work off of. Um, so when you're on tour, that's going to open up your retail options, your internet options. You know, you're going to want to organize your street team, or organize the people that are, part, that are fans of yours that have registered for your newsletter. You're going to want to focus on press, and if it's tour press, um, you're going to want to focus on the weeklies and the dailies that, that are in each particular market where you're touring. Um, you're also going to want to focus on radio. Um, radio is becoming a little bit more difficult to work with, um, I mean, and that's nothing new. Some formats still um, are, are appropriate, uh, college radio, non-commercial radio. Um, those are areas where artists can still get some visibility and those can still uh, help to raise your visibility in certain markets um, as well as um, you know, sell CDs, um, some radio segments. It has to be thought out. You know, when you're going on tour, it has to be well thought out you know, months in advance. You know, if you know, once you've booked your dates, once that is as set in stone as possible, at that point, you have to approach um, you know, you have to service uh, the venue, for example. The venue, um, you know, three weeks out, you know, minimum, uh, they're going to need posters. Uh, three weeks out, minimum, you're talking to, you know, local, regional press. You know, over and above that, you know, there are some uh, press outlets that want to hear from you, you know, six weeks out, you know, and, and you're going to continue before, you know, as you're building up to, to that date. You're going to want to continue to talk to press, continue to talk to radio. You're going to want to try to set up you know, an in-studio radio performance, if you can, or an interview to help drive folks to your date. You know, so they're, they're definitely the key is staying on top of all of the different segments leading up to your tour. You know, and it's, it's pure business. You know? It is. You have to separate yourself from the artistic side. You know, put your marketing hat on and think, how am I going to drive people to this show? You know, and think of it very directly per market. Think about what radio outlet is there, what retail outlet is there that I can talk to. Can I send posters to that retail outlet? Will they take consignment CDs from me? So it's just, you know, it's very analytic, you know, analytical. Um, you, you really have to think about all the options. You have to do a lot of research. You have to make personal relationships. And this is if you're doing it yourself. You could hire an indie publicist who has those relationships already who knows who the writers are in the particular markets and say, hey, I really believe in this band. 
they're coming through. Here's some great press that they've gotten already in prior markets. Here's some great press they've gotten on their record. Check them out. Go to the show if you want. Do a review. It would be great if you could do a preview to help drive people to the show. It's just you know the personal relationships and the time that you take building up to that particular date. It's all about that date, you know, and then it's all about the next date, you know, and it's just it's just really a slow build. Um, there's no silver bullet, you know, um, but it's it's heavy duty marketing. Thinking about how you can drive people to this date. If you're marketing yourself, you're not working with anybody else. You. You know, the internet, of course, is a great resource. Um, if you typed into Google, uh, vent, you know, uh, uh, alternative weeklies in Atlanta, you're going to find out, you know, what, you know, what publication will work best for you. You know, it's also dependent on your on your music. You know, it's just you know, doing research on, online is the first step. Um, second step is uh, it is talking to the club owner. Hey, what relationships do you have? Uh, what helps to drive people to the show. Club owners want that. You know, club owners want the show to be filled. They want they want people in the seats. They want people buying drinks. They're going to, you know, they're going to respect the fact that you're calling them, asking them, what marketing outlets can I work, you know, with to help drive people there. So they're going to know, you know, in Boston for example, they're going to know, you know, Newberry Comics is a great venue. Um, is, is a great store. Um, that's going to help people. If you can get some visibility in Newberry Comics, that's going to get people to the show at the Middle East. That's an example. Uh, what radio show you know, should I be part of? What commercial radio, what college radio do you have here? Th that is the good, a really good first step, is working with the club owner. Um, they're in the scene. Um, you know, the club owner could suggest other bands that you could play with as well that are local to that area. That might be a draw that you might be able to connect with as well. Having a great database of information um, is essential to a touring band on a, on a number of different levels. First, um, you got to be collecting names at the shows. Um, these people are going to come see you play, they're going to be blown away by your music, they're going to want to continue to hear about you later on. So you want to get their information, you want to use some sort of email campaign manager to communicate with these people for the next time you're coming through. You know, let them know, they're going to tell your friends, and you're going to see a slow build. Over and above that, it is essential to have uh, a database of all of the press contacts. As, as you're going through the market and you're making these relationships, you're going to want to go back to these people when you come through again. It's all about getting the, the up, the up, you know, it's all about the build. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, for a very, you know, you know, you can use a FileMaker database is a great way to do it. A lot of people use that, Excel. But it is key to keep, um, you know, email addresses, notes about these people, uh, phone numbers, anything that you can, personal information about these people. So when you are coming through again, you can talk to them and say, hey, remember I was here this other time. We had a great show coming through again. You know, it's, it's music business, probably more than most businesses, is a very personal business. It's all about personal relationships. Um, so it is key to keep those, you know, maintain those relationships, keep those relationships, and be on top of the information as you get it. I think ideally, if you have somebody in your band already that is just, you know, very together, you know, um, has a good business mind, um, that person to start would be great to oversee everything. You know, um, you start small. As it builds and becomes, you know, kind of out of that person's hands or you know the band wants to just focus on the creative parts um, bringing in a manager makes all the sense in the world if the manager has tech background which is becoming more and more important uh, is understanding you know web 2.0 is understanding the new ways of communicating with fans um, that would be a great aspect to that person so I think going forward you know a manager that has both personal connections with folks throughout the industry, um, folks, you know, licensing connections. Uh, if this person uh, has worked in the industry before, I think that's a positive to kind of just understand how things work. That, that would be great. But moving forward, I think it's more and more important that this, if you have a manager or just another, you know, a, a, a super fan of your band, tech knowledge and experience. Um, is, is becoming key. Prior to having a manager, um, kind of a new model 
is to add almost a, like a fifth member of the band that's just responsible for kind of building your base, you know, understanding IT, understanding uh, email communication, understanding uh, Web 2.0 on your site, um, somebody that can build something up. So manager can come in and say, oh, you've got this great infrastructure. I'm going to take that and use my connections and, and use that to um, you know, forward this band's career. Merchandising is um, becoming more and more important to the bottom line of uh, an artist, especially a touring artist. Um, when bands are starting off, typically they handle merch themselves. They're going to be ordering all of the items themselves. They're going to be um, paying close attention to what sells while, while they're on tour. They're going to experiment with placement on the table at the shows, see what works. Um, typically bands start off with uh, you know, of course, their CD and T-shirts are, are always great. Black T-shirts tend to work better than, than any other color. Um, and then bands that are starting off uh, oftentimes make, you know, very particular special items just for their fans that might have all their CDs already or might have their T-shirt. Um, you know, there's a great band called Pinback that makes tour-only EPs that are, you know, hand-stitched, very, very nice. So um, sort of helps to... Uh, build their own community up. You know, fans that are already there will go and see them again and will contribute to their merch through this specific thing that they've made just for the fans. Now, uh, a band can also, you know, af once they've reached a certain point, a band can also work with a merchandiser. What a merchandiser does is a merchandiser would give a band in advance and then um, the band uh, would kind of give all of their rights to their likeness to this merchandiser who would create specific items you know with the logo and the, the band name on there and rather than the band making all of the um, revenue from their sales they're going to be getting a cut of the merchant their merchandise because this merchandiser is hand handling the larger part of it um, you know there's you know some larger bands like Guster or Fish for example even though they're massive um, continue to uh, maintain their own merch because they want the ability to make whatever they want. They can do it quicker, um, and you know they want all of the revenue from that stuff. And they also, you know, want the personal relationship. They might add personal notes into it. But for some bands, um, Sting, Wilco, working with the merchandiser makes all the sense in the world. Just because it's, it's a, it, it can become a massive job just handling your own merch when you're at a certain level. Every venue is different, uh, but oftentimes a venue is going to charge you, you know, it could be 15% just for the kind of the space to put that table. So 15% off of uh, your gross sales for merchandise items at a particular venue is going to go to that venue. One could look at what Radiohead just did with their pay what you want uh, for the download of their record in Rainbows as an example of kind of a a way to think about the future of the industry, which is not going to be based on on mechanical royalties from selling CDs, but it's going to be based on uh, the revenue side, I think, is going to be based on touring, merchandising, and publishing. So one thing that I think is great about what Radiohead did is uh, they're giving everybody this music all at once for whatever price they want to pay for it. And um, folks are able to, you know, digest that music, you know, um, fall in love with it, share it with their friends. And Radiohead is touring shortly, so it's definitely, you know, the word of mouth happens immediately with everybody. They're all going to hear it at the same time, and that's definitely going to um, be great for their bottom line when they're on tour and selling merch. Another really good example is, you know, Prince is fantastic. Um, he's great live. He plays massive venues. He's done a couple of really interesting things. Um, his record, Musicology, was given away at all of the shows, and uh, it, you know, helped his sound scan numbers. Actually, every record, every Musicology record that was given away at the shows, was a sound scanned item. You know, and, and sound scan is how the industry, you know, uh, accounts for records sold. So he got all of this press for doing that. He was number one in Billboard because he gave away the records at all of these massive venues, um, and for his following record, uh, he put. I think it was something like 100,000 records in the Daily Mail in London. So um, it's very clear that Prince is seeing CDs as a way to build visibility and uh, you know, grow his community and get everybody to the show um, so where they're going to buy tickets and they're going to buy merch.
Prince gave away his CD in the Daily Mail uh, and, and, and you know, essentially gave away the CD for the Musicology Tour too. I didn't see an increase in my ticket price for the Musicology Tour that included, you know, there was no line item that said you are paying for Musicology. It was a free CD that I got when I went to the show. So it is, it is using recorded music as in kind of a, an incentive or as a marketing item to help draw people to shows. Physical distribution uh, for an independent artist is next to impossible. It's very, very difficult. Um, you know, distributors, physical distributors um, are looking for a label or an artist that has about a million dollars in sales annually uh, and continues to produce many records. Some independent artists, uh, like Widespread Panic is an example, um, do have a physical distribution deal. That's just with them because they tour massively. Um, you know, distributors know they're going to be able to move this product. But for 99% of independent artists, a physical distribution deal without a label is next to impossible. So what's happened over the last few years, uh, the online distributors have popped up, which really uh, drops the barriers for distribution. Um, it's an amazing thing. There are two key ones right now that exist for, you know, very specific, specifically for independent artists, and that's CD Baby and TuneCore. Um, they operate a little bit differently. Um, CD Baby takes a percentage of your um, every sale that they do, um, and TuneCore, uh, I believe, takes um, a certain uh, dollar amount per uh, retail store, online retail store that you want the CD in. But um, it's amazing. They, they do the job of the physical distributor online, so uh, they will get your CD on iTunes, which accounts for 70% of all digital music sold. Um, they'll, you know, they're moving more towards uh, working with ringtone distributors, for example. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just a really great way for folks, you know, for independent bands that are out there that are, that are gaining support to get their music worldwide. It's something that didn't exist three years ago. In addition to TuneCore and CD Baby, there are some higher level online distributors. Uh, I don't even know if they're higher level. They certainly take a higher percentage of your sales. Um, IOTA is an example and The Orchard is another example. The IOTA, IOTA and The Orchard take a higher percentage of your um, of, of the cut of all the sales that they, they make to online retailers because there's a marketing component to what they do, at least they say there is. Uh, Orchard has, I believe, 30 people in their marketing department. So what the Orchard would do is, or IOTA, they have, here's an example, IOTA has a very, um, has a password protected area on their site where tastemakers can show up. These are, these are people that run blogs, these are writers, and IOTA uh, provides these blogs or writers with uh, content that is available nowhere else. Um, so it could be the first single of a record, for example. So IOTA is saying to an independent artist um, or a small label, look, if you work with us as a, as a distributor, we provide these marketing benefits uh, and we will help to spread uh, what's happening already for you. And for that, I think the Orchard takes right now 30%. That's their fee, um, which is really high. I mean, that's, that's as high as, as what a physical distributor would take. Um, so that being said, you know, there's kind of those two different um, online distributors that you can work with, the completely do-it-yourself, TuneCore, CD Baby, and sort of the distributors that have a little bit of a marketing slant to them, um, which, by the way, will not work with all independent artists. You have to have a lot going on for IOTA or The Orchard to be working with you. They're, you know, mostly looking for smaller labels. So, and over above that, it, it, you know, how to get people to know that you exist on, uh, iTunes, for example, um, it, it really is, um, I mean, a lot of it has to do with online, you know, it's, it's key that you're, you know, in all of your communication out to your people, you're, you have a link to your page on iTunes, you know, you're letting everybody know online. Um, it's really about building up your base and then letting your base know that this exists on iTunes. So, uh, you know, that's one part of it. Then there's kind of the, the uh, working with third-party folks. So you're going to want to try to get your, you know, the blogs to know that you exist. Another interesting option with online distribution is what Snowcap is doing. Snowcap allows for um, anybody 
to buy your music off of MySpace so it, it, or any other website. It could be your own website. So they have created a little, it's a player slash music store that you can put wherever you want. You know, so it's, it's basically trying to find your fans. It's just like physical distribution. How do you get people to Newberry Comics to buy your CD? You know, there's a lot of different ways. You can do it with press, you know, radio, online. But I think with, you know, online distribution, people that are online tend to stay online. So you want to try to attack the people that are already online uh, and try to drive them to, to, um, to iTunes where your record is. So, I mean, there's a, there's a number of things, you know, uh, blog visibility is a great one. You know, you can work with other bands that are similar to yours, get visibility on their sites, uh, get visibility in their newsletters. It's just trying, you know, it's all about, you know, viral and spreading, um, spreading the word about your record. You know, I think YouTube is a great example too, you know, um, embedding YouTube links on your own site, you know, having your, you know, do a, a down and dirty video, have it on your site. Um, and then on your YouTube page, mention that the single's available on, on iTunes. It's just letting people know online in as many different ways as possible. I think there's, um, right now with musicians, uh, a lot of musicians are focusing on MySpace, which is fine. Uh, I do think that MySpace is, is sort of maxing out uh, on their ability to promote musicians. There's a lot of noise there. Uh, it's you know, I just think it's, it's, it's not as effective as it was a while ago, a year ago for musicians. So I always say, you know, it's great to have a MySpace page, but you have to have your own website, you know. Your own website allows you to do whatever you want. You know, you can sell music there, you can organize it however you like, you can update it as often as you want. Um, it's, it's very, you know, very simple. Um, and when you are putting together your own website, it's key that you make it as interactive uh, and conversational and uh, you know web 